Jesus' name. Amen. Father, Lord, we use this opportunity to exalt and honor you. To thank you for every good and possible thing you have done in our life. Father, Lord, you have been good to this family. You have been kind to us. You have been our trusted help in time of trouble. Father, this hour has come again. We are together to understand your word in this open house fellowship. Father, Lord, we ask your presence to take preeminence. Holy Spirit, we ask for your guidance. We ask for your teaching. We ask for knowledge. Knowledge that only you can give. Lord, we want you to teach us in the language we will understand. Make your word known to us. As many that are lingering between two opinions, meet them at the very point. Father Lord, as we look into your word today, teach us what we need to know. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, you are welcome once again to this Open House Fellowship. My name is Missionary Collins. I will be your host for this evening. This Open House Fellowship today, we have another exciting topic, which is Evangelist Lifestyle. Remember, we are still under the school teaching on evangelism. So, today we are looking at Evangelist Lifestyle. What is the lifestyle of an evangelist? What quality should an evangelist possess to be effective in the mission? The lifestyle of an evangelist. Our text today is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 1, from verse 1 to the end. But we will not waste so much time to read the entire chapter. As we go through the course, we will take them bit by bit. God bless you as you participate. The lifestyle of an evangelist. Evangelists have a lifestyle. Let's read Mark 1 from verse 1. What does this say? He said, The good news of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus Christ. Let's turn to King James so we can have a more robust message. Okay. In King James, it said, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in verse 2, in the prophets, Behold, I sent my messenger before thy face, we shall prepare thy way before thee. I sent my messenger before my face. I sent my messenger before my face. So John was an evangelist sent on behalf of Christ to prepare the ways of the Lord before Christ's return. That's why he said in verse 2, I send my mess in verse 3, I send my messenger before my face, who will prepare his paths before me. In verse 3, it says the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the ways of the Lord and make his path what straight. Yes. Prepares the ways of the Lord and make his path straight. What was their need for preparation? Why is it necessary as a Christian for the ways of the Lord to be prepared, for his path to be straightened before our eyes? The scripture, no matter how easy and available is it, you still need the Holy Spirit to understand it. The Bible says a carnal man cannot understand the things of God, because in his ear they are foolishness. Neither can he know them, because why? They are spiritually designed. So because carnal man cannot know the things of God, it becomes necessary for the ways of the Lord to be prepared before them, for them to be, to be born of God. And that's why John was teaching the Hebrew that they should bring fruits that was meant for repentance. Because repentance is free, but there are fruits you must possess that will allow repentance in your life to become possible. So that's why evangelists were sent out to prepare the ways of the Lord. The mission of Christ 
was to make disciple of all nations. Disciple cannot make be made except they hear. And they cannot hear except someone tells them. So that is why evangelists were sent out to broadcast the world. That's what the Bible says, has they not heard? Their word gone out throughout all the earth. Their word gone out throughout all the earth. So the message we preach is a product of the expansion of the work of the evangelist. That is what mission is actually about. Evangelists broadcast the seed. The missionaries make disciples out of the people. That is the job of an evangelist. Evangelist's word is to take the word of God from one corner of the earth to the next. Making known to the people that the word of God is real. Evangelists may not need to understand the entire scripture. Just two words is enough for him or two Bible verses. But in the case of missionary, he must be grounded in the apostolic creed to understand all the doctrine and the function of an ambassador. And that is why the missionaries are rare calling. And their job is to make sure that disciples are made from the converts or the products of evangelists. So they work are interdependent on each other. So that's why today we are taking a clue from the scripture to look at what we call evangelist lifestyle. And that will be taken from Mark chapter 1 verse 45. Mark 1 verse 45. What did Jesus say in Mark 1 verse 45? Mark 1 verse 45, he said, But when he went out and began to publish it much, and to brass abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus would no more openly enter the city, but was without in the desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. What was the job of the lepros? Who Jesus said, Now you are healed, go and show yourself to the prince, don't tell any man. But he went ahead and told the high prince that Jesus touched him. And according to Hebrew law, if the, lep the man who was leprous need to go through the ritual purification, Jesus also need to go through the ritual purification because he touched a man who was leprous, even though he touched him with the touch of healing. So, Jesus had to isolate himself for the news to die down. But isolating himself did not stop the gospel. But because this man was a great evangelist who went about publishing the news everywhere of Jesus' healing, of Jesus' deliverance, of the message of kindness that came from Christ, people came from everywhere. So the truth is, you might be a missionary in a specific location. God used you to run a specific sign. The people you meet there can take up the mantle of evangelists to publish the gospel, the word of God that came from your mouth and ran everywhere. It doesn't necessarily mean that you, the missionary, will be the one to share the message from every locality. Just like the Samaritan woman, she was an example of an evangelist. Jesus told her something personal about herself and she went into the town saying, come and see the man that told me all that I ever did. And because of that statement, the town gathered around about to hear Jesus. She was at that point Jesus' man peace. Jesus was the missionary, but the Samaritan woman was the evangelist. Strange, isn't it? Because today we seem to think evangelists are specific calling of people who God specially mandates to be an evangelist. No. Evangelists can be a spontaneous gift emanating from something you have heard or seen. Emanating from what experience you have. You can at that point become a broadcaster of the word of God to the nearby town, to your community, to your village as a whole. You have heard 
a man who told you personal things about yourself. They did not come to the church or crusade or mission or social work. They came to who? To Jesus. So you must understand that as a missionary. People may not come because you can read the Bible. After all, Bible is available in shed for less than $20. So because of that, anybody that wants Bible can easily buy one. The fact you can preach the Bible very well does not mean people will come to you because you know the Bible. People come to Jesus. Why? Because he was, he went about doing good. That was the only reason he came to him. Some came to him because they were sick. Some came because they want to see him heal others. Some came because they want, they were hungry and they were fed. Others came to see him, to see that he performed miracle in their side. To know that these things were still possible under the reign of God. So this is why people come to the church. People did not come to the church because your shoe is well polished or because you have private jet packed or because you can speak English with an excellent command. No, that is not why they came. They came because they want to see that the God we talk about if it's truly in existence in your church. That is the reason why people came to you. So as an evangelist, you take the message from the pulpit. From the man on the altar. Now the five percent of people that gather together in big churches, they gather together because they have seen the man does something unique in their time. So that is the reason why people gather to you. And when God uses you to do things that are unique, people will always gather after you. So this this power does not reside in the minister; it resides in God. And that's why they came to Jesus. They came to Jesus to discover the same thing that you today come to the church to discover. You come to the mission to discover. Why did they come to Jesus? They came to Jesus because we can discover that why they came do and do the same. People will come to Jesus from everywhere in the world. If you can only understand why the early churches, Jesus was close to the sea. He was not in the temple. The usual meeting place. He was not in the church, a well organized fruitries and choir band, and so on. He was in a village, in a deserted place, in a location that was not inhabited. Sometimes he was close to the seashore, sometimes he was in a canoe where there were mosquitoes as a supply. But people gathered around and listened. Why would they listen to him from a boat? rather than go to the temple to listen to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The reason was simple, because it has the message they need. Today, if you have what the people need, they will come to you from everywhere. I remember the last Archbishop of Benzim also said, if you put me in the cattle camp where there are five people, the church will still be filled to the brain. The reason is because it has what the people need to hear. Give the people what they need, they will gather to you from everywhere. Jesus welcomed the Holy Spirit. That was his first mission. And the Holy Spirit will know him from the foundation. Things that were exciting became created as a result of the Spirit of God moving over the surface of the water, discovering things. So when you invite the Holy Spirit into your life, positivity begins to come out of negativity. And that is why Christians must be filled with the Holy Spirit. If you must go for mission at all, the Holy Spirit should be your guiding principle and it should lead you. And if the Holy Spirit will not come with you to the mission, the mission will not be possible because it takes the Holy Spirit to witness. And without the Holy Spirit, witness in any format is not possible. That's why Christ always invite the Holy Spirit to his ministration. And Jesus leads him constantly to the Holy Spirit. If you read Mark 1 verse 9 to 12, he obeyed and gave control of his life and ministry to the Holy Spirit. So you should do the same. Going and doing whatever the Spirit indicated that he should do. Remember in the case of Lazarus, he heard that Lazarus was sick. And he was at the point of death. 
four days he stayed in the same place. Why? Because the spirit has not told him go. But when the four days were complete, even after Lazarus has been dead for four days, the spirit said go. But the work of God was manifested. That is because he listened to the command of the spirit. There is a motto I have heard throughout my entire ministry that my help does not come from man. Nor does my help come from population or the people. My help comes from the Lord, who is the creator of heaven and earth. So when your help comes from God, God will always be your help. But when you make population and cloud the source of your power, what happens when the cloud are gone? What happens when the people who are the source of your anointing are nowhere to be found? That is why this is so important. That Jesus was and is God. And when he was born, he deliberately left behind all the divine power. In Philippians 2, verse 6 to 7, let us read. Philippians 2, verse 6 to 7. Philippians 2, verse 6 to 7, make us understand that who be in the form of a God, taught it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of his servant and was made in the likeness of men. He was in the form of God, but he did not see it as a thing to venerate or as a thing of pride to be equal with God. He chose to come as a vulnerable baby, not as a military commander to rule over the tribe of Israel. No wonder the Jews did not accept him. Because they were expecting a military commander, but they got a baby instead. They were expecting a commander that would lead them as the captain of God army into battle, but they got a baby, a little child. The rich businessmen and the political ruler were looking for a king that would lead them against the Roman Empire, but what do they get? They get a preacher. So no wonder they disregarded him. Because the Pharisees would not even put themselves in the shoe. Jesus lived as a limited man, just like us, feeling cold, hunger, thirsty, joy, sadness. He also ministered as a limited man. But as a man empowered by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, as we can and must also do in every ministry we do. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, God made it clear to us. In Luke, let's read Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Luke 4, verse 18. It says to us that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Do you know why? Because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted and to preach deliverance. To the captive and recovering of sight to who? The blind. Recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty them that are bruised. That is what the spirits of the Lord gave him the right to do. Today, if you can welcome the spirit of the Lord into your ministry, into your life, you will do exactly the same work. Because Jesus says, if any man come after me, he must first of all to what? Deny himself. Take up his cross and follow his example. What are his examples? He ministered under the power of the Holy Spirit. You must do likewise. You must not be a same speaker. You must minister under the conditions and the boundaries set by the Holy Spirit. And if you do that, your ministry will enjoy supernatural growth. Jesus overcame Satan's temptation in the wilderness. How? In Mark 1 verse 13. We are still in the same Mark. Mark 1 13. Let us read Mark 1 13. Mark 1 13. Mark 1 13. I read. And he was there in the wilderness for 40 days tainted of Satan and was with the white beast. 
And the angel came to me to minister. The angel came to minister to me. He endures temptation just like you do. So don't think when you are tempted, oh God is tempting me. God does not tempt anyone with evil. It's only when we are drawn away by the lust of our eye that we are tempted. Matthew 4 verse 1 to 11, Jesus was weak, hungered, and when Satan tempted him. Jesus was not a strong, mighty, anointed servant of God, chasing devil by, or taking the devil by the neck and breaking his neck when he was tempted. He was a weak, hungry man in the wilderness when he was tempted. Just like when the devil will tempt you, he will not tempt you when you are strongest. He will tempt you when you are weakest, when you are free, when you are hungry, when your business has just collapsed, when your job and everything that will give you life has been taken away. That is when he is coming to tempt you. He is not going to come when you think you are strong, when the Holy Spirit and the anointing of the word of God in your mouth can set 10,000 demons moving. That is not when he's coming. He's coming at your weak points. When you lie down in the night to sleep, when you are alone in that lonely place of solitude and prayer, when everything in your life, you cannot explain the meaning and the reason why. That is when he's coming for temptation. And when Satan tempted him to abuse his power and turn stone into bread, because hunger can, the Bible said a hungry man will eat anything. So, when you are really hungry, after fasting like for 40 days and 40 nights, like Jesus do, you will turn stone to bread. But that was not what he did. He realized that his strength did not come from man-made effort. That his strength does not come from riches or something that he has the ability to do. The Bible says, I am allowed to do anything and everything. But not everything is good for me. He understands his limitation. And Christian must witness and minister with limitation. And he knew, though he has the authority to turn stone to become bread, but that was not the will of God. Because there was a reason why he was there. He was not there because there was no more food in the city. He was not there because there was famine in the land and there is no hope for any man. He was there because he wanted to save the face of God. You must understand, no matter the situation you are, the reason for your calling, the purpose for your ministry. Why did God send you? Why did God choose you for that purpose? Why did God present you to the people? The next, Satan told, tested him, telling him, turn bread, stone into bread. But what did Jesus say in that temptation? Simply tell Satan, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And I believe that statement originated from the reason he came. He was there to seek God's face because he knew by mortifying the deed of the flesh, the spirit can be elevated. So today, Christians must also understand that by mortifying the deed of the flesh, the spirit of God in you can come to life. That's why Christian fast. Christian does not fast for power. Christian fasts so that the flesh can be put under complete control. So that the spirit of God can be elevated. Because when the flesh is strong, the spirit is weak. And when the spirit is strong, the flesh is weak. And that's what Christ did. And that's why when Satan came in that circumstances, he knew exactly the right word to tell him. That I'm not here because I was hungry. I was not here because there was no food in the town. I was here because I want to mortify the flesh. So if the purpose why I was fasting was to get power, that would be the reason to turn stone to bread. But the reason why I fast is so that I can put my body under complete control. So that the spirit of God in me can be elevated. And what next? Satan went. Satan tempted him to void his suffering on the cross. Satan told him to prove, to promote himself. Ah, he tempted him to neglect the cross, to void his power. 
If you are the son of God, cast yourself down. Cast yourself down. It is written, he will give his angels to lift you up. What? Suicide ministry is not the plan of God for believers. No Christian should go on a suicide mission and say, God is with me. Only once in my lifetime I have seen pastor that ran his car one around 80 kilometers per hour and, and told him, why are you doing this? He said, because I have a covenant with God that I will not die by accident. And I look at him very well. I say, my people perish for lack of knowledge. It is written in the word of God, thou shalt not test the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not test the Lord thy God. It is written. You don't jump down from a speeding flight, say God will send his angel to give charge over me so that I will not dash my foot against the ground. Your bone will be crushed because God will not deliver you. That was Satan's motive. His motive was the second temptation, just bow down your knee and worship me. The death will not be important. The cross will not be important. You don't need to suffer all those things. Or just worship me. And I will give you everything. Christians should avoid taking shortcuts. Shortcuts does not lead to growth in the ministry. It leads to downfall. Do the hard labor. God said, you want your ministry to grow? He says, if you exhort him, he will draw all men to himself. Let God be lifted up in your ministry. God is the one that will do the evangelism. Jesus ministers in forest, in the village. He did not go to the TV station. But yet, people came. Do you know why? God and the Holy Spirit announced his ministry abroad. Your ministry can still be announced by the same method, by the Holy Spirit. Since I've been a minister, I've never witnessed in big city. I've witnessed in local villages, vulnerable population, people that have no money to pay for tickets. They have no internet or network service. But yet, God draw them to himself. And God always has a purpose of lifting his name up. And he does it in manifold ways. There is no point in Paul ministry where there was a TV station or internet or radio. But yet, God publishes his name abroad. Even to the extent the sick were laid on the ground so that his shadow can follow them. Clothes were taken from him to lay upon the sick so that they can recover. Do the work. Don't take shortcuts. The Bible says, the soul that sinners shall die. And that does not change irrespective of whether you are a bishop or you are a pastor or you are a deacon or even the Pope. Don't join multitude to do evil. Oh, we are now in the modern time where sins are now right. Where righteousness is not sin. So I have to follow what the people want. The only people who gave the people what they want was Saul. And we know how his ministry ended. If you give the people what they want, your ministry will end like that of Saul. God told Saul clearly, I have promised that your house will abide before me. But thus says the Lord, whoever honor me, I will honor. He that disregard me shall be lightly esteemed. If you disregard the Lord your God, you will be lightly esteemed. If you honor God, God will honor you. And the Lord sent a message through the prophet Samuel to Saul to tell him, because you have rejected the ways of the Lord, the Lord has also rejected you from being king over Israel. It's simple. If you reject his promises, you reject to follow his laws, to follow his discipline, he will also reject you. I have ministered to people, talk to them, even cancel many. Few 
of them hearken unto the voice of the Lord, and they receive the reward. All that disobey, and they receive the they pay the consequences. There is no amount of prayer or fasting that will change the will of God. There is no discipline of church going or tax or special seed that will change God's purpose. I told one person long ago that there is a reason why I don't profess that. That if God said you would die, you would die. There is nothing that will change it. But God will not say to you you would die without telling you a reason why. If you don't obey that reason, obedience to God is better than sacrifice. To hearken is better than the fatness of a ram. I have seen people in Africa running around the camp fasting for power. You don't fast for power. Power does not come through fasting. You can only get God's power by obedience to His rule. Jesus said these signs will follow them that believe. What does it mean? If you believe His word, His commandment, which He gave, and what was His commandment? You should go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The signs will automatically follow you. You don't need to do special work for it. Because this is a promise. And the Bible says God honors his word more than his name. You want power? Go and do the work. Get your hand dirty. The power will flow. I remember when I was called into the mission. I, when I lingered in a place, going to a place to fast and ask God for direction. It was not yet the third day when the Lord said to me, you are in the place, go now. He didn't need me to stay and complete the specified authority of days that I gave to myself as a limitation to seek his face. But that very day, he said, go now. The remaining fast will be completed in the work. You don't need to stay in the place. Just like when you are sick, you have heart attack. And you need to fast for seven days to cure heart attack. You will be in your grave before you finish the fasting. Why? What stopped you from praying that instant? Oh, you have not fasted enough. Or you need to spend three hours to confess all the sins of your grandparents. I tell you, when you are in the mortuary, you still be confessing your sin. The only way to serve the Lord is with sincerity, following His plan. The laws doesn't lie. There are guidelines laid down in the scripture. Follow the same guideline. You will get the same reward and the same direction. And if your guideline is not working, check it and read through it again. See if you are missing something. Because I know God is not a man that he should lie. He is not the son of man that he should repent. Let's take a character in the scripture. Bala. Bala make Balak offer seven bullock and a ram upon each other. Seven bullock, which is equivalent today with offering seven cats before a man of God to perform just a particular miracle. And you know what God said to him? After all the vow, after all the tithes, after all the free will offering, after all the, do, the, the, humil, the voluntary donation, the Lord said to him, God is not a man that should lie. God is not the son of man that he should repent. So it doesn't matter what you give to him. His laws are his law. His promise and his covenant, which he made to Abraham, he keeps. What did he tell Abraham? He said, I will, you will be the father of many nations. I will bless anyone that bless you. And I will curse anyone that curse you. And here was a prophet who got his source and authority from God, though he was a soothsayer, coming to help to curse God's people. What did God say to me? You cannot curse that which I have blessed. It's simple. You cannot. It doesn't matter the sacrifice you offer. It doesn't matter. The laws you put on ground, you cannot. Just like some Christians, oh, what do you want? I want God to give me dominion over these people. No. 
God has said, I gave you authority over the beasts of the forest, over the flying things, over every creeping thing upon the earth, but they set over another man. Has the Lord not given you dominion? You cannot have dominion over your fellow man. Trying to do so is a sin against God. And God considers it an abomination in his sight. Just like God will not see two people playing sports and will favor one side over another. No, God will not do it. God is God. He created all of us for his glory. He allowed the rain to fall upon the righteous and the wicked alike. And the sun upon the just and the unjust. He does not say this is a sinner, so no rain will fall in your house. Or the air you breathe will be taken away. No. He gave it equally to all. The same way he expects you as a believer not to have respect of person. What happened to Satan at the end of all this temptation? He went away defeated. Do you know why? Christ realized one, the purpose why he was there. Two, the reason he was called. Three, he realized the limitation of his authority. And once you as a Christian know those three, Satan will always be defeated before you. Jesus was put preaching high on his list. So as a believer, no matter the limitation you find yourself, as a missionary, or as a pastor, or as an evangelist, always find an avenue to preach the gospel. If you cannot reach anybody, preach to your family. If you cannot reach even your family, preach to the next and the nearest person you can feel. If you cannot even reach anybody, take your phone, record a message. If you don't have access to electricity, take a book, write the message, make it clear. When I started my ministry, there was no phone, no access to computer, but I took booklets. All these messages you now heard in the mission were written while in the feed. The message you receive from God, what did God say to Habakkuk? Write the vision. Make it plain. Write it on top of a tablet that it may run for many years. And I tell you, at the end, it will speak. It will not lie. So let your message, write it down. You might not be the pastor God showed you in your vision today. You might not be that great minister that is head of around the world. But I tell you, if you write your vision and you make it plain, put it on top of a tablet, follow the guidelines of the Lord, it will not lie. After many years, it will speak. He said his message was what? Good news. This is where many Christians and evangelists miss the mark. Jesus did not send you to tell people they are condemned, that God is going to sentence all of them to death in hell. No. That is not the message. And that part of the message, yes, but it's not the message we are sent to preach. The message we are sent to preach is good news. Make sure the good news is sent. What was the good news Jesus gave to the woman at the Samaritan well? Whoever drink this water will go taste it again. But whoever give, get the water that I will give him will never taste. The water I gave him will become a source of the living water, springing up into everlasting life. And what did the woman say? Give me this water. Do you think if Jesus had said to the woman at the beginning of his message, you have been married to four husbands, the woman will say, Jesus, congratulations for saying that. It is true. No. He will walk away disappointed. But what did he start his message with? Good news. Whoever drink, give me water to drink. That was his first message. Give me water to drink. Give me water to drink. From there leads to another. Known fully where the woman will refuse. For something, somebody will say something as simple as just give me water to drink. Yes. Jesus knew what that the Jews and the Samaritan has no day. God does not ask you questions because he doesn't know. He asks you a question because you already know the answer. 
So you as a believer must also ask questions because you already know the answer. So he understands the topography of the place. He knew the law. That the Samaritan and the Jews have no day. But yet he asked the Samaritan to give him water to drink. And the woman was amazed. Not because she was selfish. Not because she was wicked. But because she was amazed that the Jews and Samaritan has no water. No deal. That even if a Samaritan woman give water to a Jew, she would throw the water away. This was the kind of enmity that existed between the two of them. But how would this man, being a Jew, ask me water to drink? And Jesus answered her by saying, If you know the gift of God, and the one that said to you, Give me water to drink, you would have asked him. He would have given you the living water. So you have living water, why did you ask him for what? And Jesus said to her, Whoever drink this water you are given will be tasted. Just give him four hours, he will be tasted again. But if you drink my own, you will never taste again. And today there is still water that you will drink and you will never be tasted. And that is the good news. That is what God gave to us to preach. I remember my first mission. When others were busy telling people how to quote Genesis to Revelation, the Lord gave me one simple message. God has sent blessing to this house. God has sent peace to this house. God has sent joy to this house. Even the unbeliever were jumping up their heads saying, Amen. Even the same people that just chased a pastor away with cutlass, when they heard my message, they came to listen. Because all I gave them was good news. And at the end, I said to them, This good news, I need one person. If you are him as your Lord and Savior, all this good news will come to your hearts and rest. They say, We are certain. <laughs> but what happened to this man that said, John 3 16, uh, John 19 18, or oh, in uh, Revelation, there is end of all sinner in hell. What happened to his message? Though his message was from the scripture, they were correct. But the people never listened. But mine was from the scripture. He was correct. Presented in the language the people understand. And they did listen. So you can present bitter message in a sweet pill and people will take it. But you can present sweet mercy in a bitter pill. People will reject it. Yes. The Bible said we impart knowledge as believer. Knowledge of things to come. Knowledge of the ends of all things. But only among the mature. Among the mature. That's why in open heart fellowship we separated to the same teaching. Every Tuesday, we teach the scriptures. But only on Sunday evening, we teach the prophecy and the eschatology of the end time. The reason is because the two meet together will send wrong signal to the people who are teaching. And that's why we try to make the gospel as easy and as understandable as possible. So that the people can understand that the word of God is always good news. It's not a news of torment. It's not a news of condemnation. But it's a news to draw all men to God. Because you cannot force the people to come to God. Remember through the book of Revelation, the people were tormented. But in their torment, they never went to God. There is no amount of threats you will give to the inhabitant of the earth dweller that will make them give up their idol and their evil way. No way. The only way people can come to God is give them good news. Everybody loves good news. Even the devil likes good news. Give them good news. And what is the good news? Good news that their sick can be healed, that their death can live again, that their problem can be solved. That their financial problem can be met with blessings from the Lord. This is the news they need. 
Tell them that there is a future for God's people. That death is not the end of life. Tell them that Christ has gone 2,000 years ago to prepare us a home. That even if you are not rich in this world, that in the world to come you can have heavenly mansion. Tell them the blessing that God has prepared for his people are both on earth and in heaven. Tell them that the time has come. Tell them that the people should repent and believe in the Lord and save their soul that there is only one salary for sin, which is death. So tell them that that is not the salary they will want to pay their family and their children with, or train them, or raise their education with it. Tell them it's only a fool that causes sin and judgment, because in it, underneath lies death and frustration. We often witness for Jesus quietly, and loving true life. But eventually people must be challenged to repent, to turn to God and to believe. And not let one or one say that preaching is unpopular. Preaching is not unpopular. Many people in Ecuador, Pensacola, Florida Church have seen 100,000 conversions in two years by the same preaching. Carlos and Akoda in Argentina have seen over 8 million decisions for Christ, all through what? Preaching the good news. So you can, I have seen an entire village transformed and accept Christ by simply preaching the good news. No one person rejected the whole village accepted Christ. Through preaching the good news. You can still do the same. Jesus knew God's time. What? God's time? Yes. Every believer should know God's time. Jesus walked until he was 35 years old. But when he put John in prison, that was God's trigger for the gospel. Because there cannot be two prophets in the same time. One had to give room for the next. But when John was thrown in prison, Jesus knew that the kappa, that his ministry had started. Why must he wait till John was in prison? Because it was God's time. Jesus knew his time has come. He, he, we are told to keep watch so that we might understand when Jesus is at the door. So Christians must understand, though you have a calling, there is a trigger time for the call. God does not call a child and trust him into the ministry without first giving him the grand training needed for the wolf. You are not sent as sheep in the midst of grass or green herb. You are sent as sheep in the midst of wolves. And there are many ravoling wolves in the world out there. It only takes a comprehensive knowledge from God, divine wisdom, spiritual maturity, and understanding to survive among the wolf. That's why in CGF, we don't believe in natural call. We train our missionary despite the call. We train them to understand the feed. We train them to have experience in the things of God. We train them to hold the scriptures above all vision, above all knowledge, above all powers. What does Paul say? What does the Peter himself testify? He said, I was with Christ on the Mount of Configuration. I don't need, we were not, we do not follow fable and dreams. We were high weakness of his majesty. We saw him transfigure before our eyes. We saw Moses and Elijah came down to, and talk with him. He said, beyond this, we have a more sure word of prophecy. It doesn't matter what you have said. It doesn't matter how many dead are raised. It doesn't matter how many sick are healed. But we have a more sure word of prophecy. 
Which one is easier? Your sins are forgiven or you are here. So let's understand that the scriptures is the scripture, is the standard of the word of God. Try it any other ways, it will not work. Follow the same futures that Christ laid down in the scriptures, it will work magic. Do it exactly the way he does it, you have the same result he has. And the gospel, if we should keep one eye on God's prophetic word, on the church, and on Israel, and one eyes on what events. Christians read newspaper. Christians listen to news. Do you know why? Because the Bible says, "Watch." You cannot watch if all you do twenty four hours a day is look at the Bible. No, you have to compare what is in the Scripture with what you see on your day to day life. That's how Christians watch. Christians look at the nation of Israel. What event is going on there? They look at the church, then they look at the world. Because these three will determine the future of the world. That's why we watch as Christian. In Mark 13, verse 28 to 36, and Matthew 16, verse 1 to 3, we have Christ telling us, watch. Watch, because you don't know when your Lord will come. No one knew the time he built the ark. The ark of Noah, some people say the Noah preached any message. Yes, the ark was built for 450 years. 450 years as an evangelist. Noah was preaching the message of God for 450 years. That ark was a message to the people. Despite you did not see rain, despite you did not see strong wind, the Lord will destroy the earth with rain. It was a message. Moses knew the times and he led God's people to freedom. Pharaoh, look, which God can be greater than I am? All my soldiers see me as God. And he forgot, he takes the vision of God to make him God. On that, Joseph. But he failed that the same God who make him God can make him a servant overnight. So when men acclaim glory to themselves, they should consider how they get there in the first place. Because failure to realize how you get to the top will mean you can crumble in a flash. I hate people on earth that I hit hand on their chest say, if you know who I am, who are you? You are nothing but dust and ashes. Your flesh is dust. And your bone arches. Is that who you are? That you make boast over who you are? You are less than man. You are just like a grass. In the morning you grew up. And like in the evening you withered. Just like flowers. The grass faded and the flower withered. So does your life. That you should make boast of who you are. That they knew the time. He prayed to end the exiles of his people. Why? He understood by books. There was no TV in his time, so he could not have watched news. But there were books. He read it, and he understood by books. Christians should watch TV. They should listen to news. And at the same time, Christians should listen to what God is saying in the scripture. Always balance the two, so that you can know the time you are. God knew the time and he sent Jesus. Why did he not send Jesus in Genesis? Because it was not yet time. Jesus knew the time and he preached the gospel. Jesus called order to help him today. He did not do everything by himself. So you called into the ministry of God should not do everything by yourself. Let's read from verse 16 to 20 of the same Mark 1. What did he say? Now, as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simeon and Andrew, his brother, 
casting net into the sea, for they were fishers or fishermen. In verse 17, and Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you become fishers of men. So learn and understand, O ye ministers of God. God called one, and one multiply. God does not call everybody individually. Don't say, I am not called of God because God did not come to my dream to show me how many buildings of church I should build. No. God called the ministers. You all are called into his labor. The moment the ministers send call upon you to join in the call of God in his life, you are automatically called into the ministry. The disciple of Jesus Christ, were they not called? Yes. Were they called directly by God as Jesus was sent? No. God sent Jesus. Jesus chose 12. That means God called one Jesus. Jesus called 12 disciples. And the 12 called 70. And 70 called 3,000. 3,000 called 5,000. 5,000 called 120,000. And so the church multiplied. My dear, God does not call everybody individually. God is not a talkative. God speaks once. And that's what the Bible says, Once hast thou spoken, and twice have I heard. All power belongs to God. No man can do anything. It's just like some minister said, I would have healed him, but God has not told me to. Do you need to wait for God to speak before you heal the sick? Do you need to wait for God to speak before you raise the dead? Do you think God will come and tell you, go and raise that dead? No. He will not say so. <laughs> the Bible says the righteousness that is of faith does not say who will ascend into heaven or who will descend into hell. What does he say? The word is in deep. It's near you. It's in your mouth. God's word is in your mouth. Whatever you use it to speak will come to pass. You can use your mouth to change the decision of the earth. You don't need to wait for God to say it. In verse 17, And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And 18, he said, Straightforward, the words they obey. They forsook their net and they follow Christ. And in verse 19, And when they have gone, they lead you far further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brothers, and he said also, and who were also in the sheep, mending their nets. And straightforward, he caught them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the sheep, with the higher servant, and went after him. They left their father in the sheep with the higher servant, and they went what? after Christ. So Jesus was called alone, but he called 12 disciples. And what happened? Those 12 disciples, even when he teach them hard lesson, they did not go away. That shows you that when you, when God called you, the voice of God is in your mouth. Whoever you called is called. That's why the Lord said, Believe the Lord your God, and you shall prosper. Believe his servant, and you shall be established. The moment the servant of God called you into the ministry, you are called into the ministry. You don't have to see vision or revelation. Your vision will be given you in the feet. So enlarging the weakness and sharing the workload. First, there was only Jesus. Then Jesus called 12 more. And the 12 called 3,000. And 3,000 became 5,000. And people from the nation joined the movement. And the gospel reached Africa, Asia, and onward. Today, it is worldwide. So you don't need to wait. Say, I would have done the work. But God did not call me to become a pastor. But your pastor called you. What is the difference? Jesus shows the power of God. How? He cast out devils. He did not only cast out devils, he healed the sick of malaria and fever. 
He hid many and drove out demons. In 1 verse 33 and 39, he healed a leper. Every time Jesus showed the power of God, which is the love and compassion of God and action, the good news spread. So it is said to you and your ministry today, each time you stretch your hand and you lay hand on the sick and they recover, and you say to the people that have been barren for 20, for 40 years, receive the fruit of the womb, and it came to pass the good news spread. So much so that the whole town came to sin in 33 and 37. Jesus was committed to prayer. No ministers on earth survived as that prayer. I remember when I was doing the call, I like, sit down at home, I was wasting time. When somebody asked me, I thought you were called into the ministry, I said, God time has not come. When God time come, God will show me and he will come and tell me. <laughs> Until God came to me and said to me, you wasted so so and so years of your life. Will you still waste the remaining ones? Then I knew I was busy wasting time. That if God was already speaking, telling me what he wanted me to do. And Jesus only ever did what he saw his father doing. In John 5, verse 19. Jesus make it clear, all that I see the father do, the same work I did. He said, and the father raises the dead, so does the son, quicken whoever he chooses. It's not who the father told him to quicken, who he chooses to quicken. So, God is not going to tell you who to heal or who to raise up from the dead or who to pray for. No. The decree has already been done. O ye men of little faith, go ahead. Prophesy in the name of the Lord and it will come to pass. What did God said to prophet Ezekiah in the valley of Dragon? Prophesy to this world. Did he tell him what to say? No. Prophesy to the world. To do that, he made time to listen to his father. Because how do you listen to God? Having a personal and a quiet time. Meditating on his word. The Bible says that what has I hidden in my heart? That I might not sin against thee. Let the word of God be hidden in the tablet of your heart. Spend time to meditate on the word of God. Sometime it was very, it was early in the morning. Sometimes it was late in the night. Sometimes it was when he was walking all through his walk. Sometimes it was in his private office, studying the scriptures, building the mission sites. Spent time to meditate in private and in public. Afterward, he knew what to do. In Mark 1.35, Mark 1.35, what did Jesus say? And in the morning, rising up a great while before the day, he went out and departed into a solitary place. And there he prayed. So what about you? Oh, why can't we do what Jesus did? Why can't we pray the same way Jesus prayed? Jesus in the day ministers under the influence of the Holy Spirit. In the night, he went to God in prayer. What about you? How do you minister? You're waiting for the power to automatically fall into your head? No. You have to do the work. Jesus was committed to the people. He had the opportunity to stay in one place and become famous. And become a church of five million people. But that was not what he did. He wanted to go towards the nearby villages. There is one thing ministers need to understand. Nothing a mature man will not make you a loving father. It will make you a competitor. If you want to nurse, look for a child to nurse. Don't go looking for mature men who are already matured to nurse. Raise babies. Train them until they are mature, send them out. Then look for other babies 
raise them until they are mature, send them out. You will be more, you will do more for God. Though you will not become famous in the media, though your church will not be worldwide, though you will not be invited for some special occasion to speech, but you will be doing more for God than the man that gathered his table. Stay in one place and become famous. Wants to go towards a nearby village to preach there also. Go to the next town. When you finish for one town, don't remain there. Don't say these people have become Christian. Let them give us a land where we can build our church. No. Leave that place. There are people for whom that land is prepared. If you don't leave the place, the people don't have room for growth. If you leave the place, the message you give them will energize growth. What you need is not to remain in a location. It's to spread. You have finished preaching the message, training people for discipleship. The disciple you train need room for expansion. Many of them may not even have more than one language. Why not give the room to the nearby town where they can preach also, where they can also expand the same way you expand. So you don't need to envelop them. That's why in CGF, we don't preach twice in one time. We give the time opportunity to grow. We preach once, raise missionary and train them to the finish. We send the missionaries to the nearby cities to capture their own town by themselves. Because we don't expect you to preach from the town nearby town. If not, the Great Commission will never finish. Because you have to do all the work. But if you give room to those you have grown to be able to preach the gospel, the Great Commission will be finished in a while. Today we have more than 2 billion Christians. If those 2 billion Christians are really grown to become 2 billion disciples, today we will no longer have any place to evangelize. The Lord would have come by last year. But today, those 2 billion believers are in one church, paying tithes to one another. And tomorrow the man said to you on the TV and network, I can never be poor. How can you be poor when you have 2 million people sowing seeds to you every Sunday? You can't be poor. But is that the message of Christ? How many people does he lead to heaven? Why am I not against any of those things? But the purpose of the gospel must be preached. Because the Bible says this gospel of the kingdom must be preached to all nations as a testimony against them before the end can come. Why do we save the lost prayer? Because we want God's kingdom to come. If the kingdom of God must come, we must preach the gospel to our nation. Jesus loved the people. Even they had to love like the demon process. So you should not be different. I was in a place in Africa where somebody told me I have prayed seven people to death. And I asked the man, God sent me to save people. And you are telling me you prayed them to death. Is that the job God gave you? Is it possible for Christians to pray other people to death? Yes. Very possible. But that is not our job. John and the apostles in the scripture wanted to do it. But what did Jesus say? You don't know what manner of spirit you are made of. The Son of Man has not come to take men's life, but rather to save them. God does not send you to kill the king witches but to drive out the witches inside them and love the people. God does not send you to kill demons, but to drive out the demons inside them and love the people. God does not send you to a lot hearts, but rather to drive out, to hate the sin and love the person. That is what Christianity is about. Jesus loved the people. Even the heart to love, the demon possessed, the sick woman, the leper, those who were amputated, the beggar, the lame, the cripple, the paralyzed, the dead, he raised them up. To commit to reach more people with the love of God, the results 
was that the people came to him from everywhere. Because people only come to the man who cares. They don't come to the man who hates them. So if you want people to come to you from everywhere, you have to love the unlovable. You have to pray for the unprayable. You have to deliver the undeliverable. And people will come to you from everywhere. Jesus was a man who ministers in the power of the Holy Spirit do the same. Jesus said that anyone who has faith in him cannot cannot only do the same thing that he has done. Even greater things than what he has done will he do through the power of the Holy Spirit whom Jesus sent to us. And he has sent out the Holy Spirit. We have the evidence. We prophesy. We speak in tongues. We see dreams. We perform signs in his name. So what more do you need? The same questions to consider. What are your plans to reach the people? What is your commitment to prayer? What are you using the gift of the Spirit of God for in your life? Are you saying yes to Jesus whenever he called you? Or you want him to wait for your own time? My will, not God's will. Can you see that God's time is now? Is preaching a priority to you or just a part-time job? Are you overcoming Satan's temptation every day by prayer and the word and by making holy decisions? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you first believed or you are still being filled with him every day? These are questions you must answer for yourself. If God must take you to the heart, he has prepared for you. Today, Christians from all over the world, they tend to preach the gospel, but many, only few understand that God is not mock concerning his promise. Whoever can mock in God's sight is a long suffering to the person. Brethren, you have heard the word of God. These teachings were not given to you to disregard your belief or to condemn anyone. This teaching was given so that the man of God can be equipped to do every good work. Today, you can still be equipped by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the anointing that Jesus' Spirit provides, by the authority that we receive through the gospel. Today, if you hear his word, don't harden your heart. As in the days of provocation, when your father provoked him in the wilderness, you know how that generation ended. Brethren, today God is still looking for those of us who will willingly surrender themselves to the purpose and to the same grace he called them with. Remember how the early apostle ministers. They ministered as a man filled with the Holy Spirit. They ministered under the guidance and the counseling of God. You can still do the same. You can still minister as a believer. You can still minister as a child of God. You can still minister as somebody who has learned the truth and has understood it. You can still minister as somebody who sees heaven as his only authority. Brethren, today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow might be too late. These signs will follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out devil, heal all manner of disease. Take the serpent by the hand, and it shall not harm them. Oh, freely you have received this gospel, freely give. Brethren, this is where we're going to end today's teaching. But before we end, Let's bow our heads to pray and ask God for guidance and direction. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for your grace that is sufficient for us. We thank you for your grace that is made perfect in weaknesses. Father, we have heard the word. How we can become an evangelist unto the Lord. 
and how to live the lifestyle of an evangelist. Father, make us what you have built us to be. Prepare us a sanctuary unto the Lord, pure and holy, tried and true. We want to be a living sanctuary for you. O oh Lord, I want to be your evangelist. And I want the team that I lead to grow, to become your evangelists. Lord, give them the grace to be a witness to you, to all nations, to take your gospel far and wide through hearts the entire world, to study to show themselves approved unto God as a workman that need not to be ashamed, but rightfully dividing the word of truth. Lord, as a word for as many that will believe this word and practice, as they lay hand upon the sick, they will recover. They will cast out devil, heal all manner of disease. Take the serpent by the hand, it shall not harm them. Eat poisonous food, drink deadly water, nothing shall by any means hurt them. Father, you will open for them the gate of the kingdom of heaven. That whatever they bound on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever they lose on earth will be lost in heaven. Mm -hmm. O oh Lord, upon your sons and daughters, will you pour out your spirit this night? Mm -hmm. For in Jesus' mighty name we we'll pray. Mm -hmm. Brethren, if you have missed any of this session, you can still see it on our website at cgfnslogin.app or go to Facebook search for CGF Open House. God bless you as you participate. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mama. Brethren, this is where we end our today's teaching.